That is awesome, huh? Praise God. I tell you, I love that song. I think that's a need to breathe, isn't it? I'm from Possum something, South Carolina. <laughs> Amen. How's everybody doing? I want to do something special before I get into the Word. Are y'all ready for the Word this morning? Come on. How many y'all ready for the Word of God this morning? Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm ready for the Word. I want to do something. Um, you know, uh, as we started our school here, um, of course, my children go here as well. But, you know, uh, the Abeka program has a Bible course. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with that. And, uh, yeah, I just, my son, Skylar, you know, and I, I know this is going to be a little biased because he's my son. But, uh, you know, he came home the other day, and uh, he started just telling me all the stuff that he's learning. And I'll be honest with you, I was blown away when he started telling me about his memorization of Scripture. And uh, he said, Dad, you want to hear my verses? So I thought he was going to say, you know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. <laughs> you know, I was waiting on something. So he starts uh, repeating Hebrews chapter 11, verses 7 through 11. I said, what? I told him he's going to have to start teaching Daddy. I tell you, I mean, you know, that's some hard passages of Scripture. You know, we like to, we like to uh, I don't know if I can shut this off. Is this not shut off? I just get away from it. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> How many of you know, you know, I'm, I'm good with Hebrews 1. I'm good with Hebrews uh, 11, 1, 11, 6. But, you know, th those are some difficult passages. But I just wanted to share with you that uh, not only to have some bragging rights on Skylar. Come on, somebody. But uh, also just because, you know, this is what you're sowing into when you give at Grace City. Uh, you give into the future of that. Praise God, you know. And that's really the vision here is for us to build uh, families of strong leaders, children who are going to grow up and be mighty in the things of God. Come on, amen. They're going to uh, become our next senators and governors and teachers and pastors and doctors and lawyers and all the things that, that we need uh, in this nation. And uh, it starts with their foundation. How many know everything starts with a foundation? Anything that you build in this life has to have a foundation. And the, the greater the foundation is, come on, the greater the structure is. And so we just believe in building a firm foundation here at Grace City, built on the truths that are on God's Word. Amen? So I was just excited to share that with you. If you have your Bibles, let's go to work this morning and turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to be, I'm going to read a ton of Scripture um, because uh, I feel like God's moving me uh, in a couple different areas. And so we're going to kind of wind up this series. But how many know it's going to be good? Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be good. Amen. Pastor said it was going to be good. <laughs> so uh, when you get there, say, I got it. And verse uh, 1, chapter 5, Galatians. This is the Apostle Paul. We've been in the book of the study through the book of Galatians. And uh, Paul is um, the author here. And he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect to you whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit await the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth any nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not from him that calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be of none otherwise minded, but he that shall trouble you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the cross of the offense of the cross ceased? Paul's asking a question. I would they were even cut off that trouble you. Men say, ouch. <laughs> 
For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. That word liberty means freedom. Only not to use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed lest you be consumed of one another. Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit glory to God and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the lust of the flesh uh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would but if you be led of the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, amenial, amil, uh, come on, somebody help me out, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, which I tell you before, as I've told you in the past time, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, here's the good part, is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. For that Christ have been crucified with the flesh and all the affections and lusts. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. Quickly back up to John chapter 8. Let's just rewind. I want to share one more quick verse and we're going to get into today's message. John chapter 8. Context here. Jesus is talking with his disciples. Many of you know uh, what he's saying. He's talking about those who believe on him. And if we pick up in verse 30, he says, As these spake these words, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word. Underline that in your Bibles. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. In the famous verse, And you shall know the truth, and the what? The truth shall make you free. I want to preach to you this morning for a few minutes on the subject of spiritual freedom. If you don't like that title, you can call it Get Free and Stay Free. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you again for the word of God. We thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that your ministry is alive and active. And we pray that you would help us to see Jesus today in all of his majesty, his glory, his sufficiency. Uh, we know that if we see Jesus, we'll leave here changed uh, and just become more and more like you. And so, Father, we thank you for this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said? And everyone said? You know, I loved growing up on the east coast of Florida. Uh, some of you know uh, I've shared a little bit. Uh, one of the things I loved doing as a young man was poaching hogs. I meant, did I say that? I meant hunting hogs. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, BC days, you know, one of the things I liked to do was, uh, uh, there wasn't a whole lot growing up in Titusville, and, uh, but we did have a very, very large uh, selection of hogs to hunt. And so, uh, just so that all the hog, best hog hunting was on NASA, was out there at the Cape. And so that's where we went. And we knew the dangers of, uh, of going out there and, and, and trying to catch these hogs. Uh, first, it's federal property. Uh, it's not like you get caught by your local game warning. Uh, it's very serious. Uh, you're playing around NASA where uh, there's armed military uh, who are protecting the space shuttle. But growing up there, the, the fear and the danger of these things just didn't really seem uh, real important to me because I grew up there and I kind of knew the ins and outs and everything. And, 
And so we just made a habit of going out there and, and catching hogs. And uh, one of the things that we used to do, <laughs> this is horrible, is the trapper that was out there. Now, you've got to understand, this is B.C., all right? Y'all don't start throwing stones. I see your faces. Don't get religious in here. So uh, anyway, you know, one of the things we'd do is we'd go check the trapper's traps. <laughs> so one night, you know, John Tanner, this was a guy that had all the hog rights there. We, uh, we knew where his trap was, and so we decided we're going to go check his trap. It's a about one o'clock in the morning. Well, the thing about checking his trap was his traps were very well hid and they were way back into these long roads that were no access roads. So the problem was if you saw headlights, you knew you were caught because you weren't supposed to be out there. So it wasn't a public access road like some of the areas that you could be on and things like that. And so me and my cousin one night, we go down there and we, we go all the way to the end of this thing and we find the trap and it's empty. And so I said, well, we'll just go find another place and we were going to go put out some dogs here. And so we turn the truck around. Lo and behold, my cousin sails the truck off and gets us stuck. So now fear grips us. What are we going to do? So uh, one of my buddies with me, he said, well, I, you know, the truck's a two-wheel drive. He says, how are we going to get out of here? And, I, and he says, well, look, we got to come along. And another, another my cousin found this, this long, uh, we, we worked in uh, crane work, and so we had the old slings that were rated uh, to pick up things that we rigged with. If they had a few bad spots on them, we would be able to keep them. And so we had this, this uh, nylon sling that was rated for like, I don't know, several thousand pounds. So we get the come along, and we get it around a tree, and we get it around the truck with this sling and we go to put the truck in neutral and we're jacking this truck out of here. Y'all following with me? Just look at your neighbor and say, work, work. <laughs> we get the truck out only to find out we still can't move the truck and we got to find another tree. So y'all following with me? So we go from tree to tree to tree to tree, slowly getting this truck back on the hard road. In the meantime, my fear is that we're going to get caught. I'm just waiting any time now to see these headlights beaming down the road and it be either NASA or the guy himself checking his trap. And so this goes on until 1 o'clock in the morning. We're a nervous wreck. We're thinking, oh, Lord, we're going to jail. They're taking the truck. Anybody hearing me? You know, we've got to, <laughs> we've got to go to Orlando because it's a federal jail. You don't go to your local jail. And so we're thinking about all these things, jacking this truck out of here, trying to get out of here. And finally, we get the truck out of the hole. We get in the truck, barrel down this road doing 100 mile an hour, literally. Get out to the hard road. We're like, we're free, we're free. We get across the hard road and make it out into the limits of Titusville. And it was such a liberating freedom. Has anybody ever felt that before when you just know you made it? Come on, somebody, somebody with me this morning. You just know you got away with it. Come on, amen. And it was just freedom. <laughs> Same way I think today the Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Galatia and he's saying to us that we need to enjoy our freedoms and not go back into a system of bondage. We need to learn to enjoy our freedoms in Christ and as Paul said earlier that we don't use those freedoms as a, as a, as a, as a place to go and get into the flesh. To we we uh, override our consciences and we do things knowing that it's against the spirit of God. The first thing I noticed this morning is Paul says that we have a choice. Isn't that awesome? He says we have a choice. Notice what the apostle says in verse 1. He says, stand fast. I like that word, stand fast. Stand firm. Don't be moved in what you're doing, showing us that we have a choice in whether to stay free or not. What an amazing concept, church, that we can choose. Huh? That we have a choice. I think a lot of times in the church today, we forget the concept that each one of us who have been born with the Spirit of God now has the power to choose. One of the great liberating things when I got born again and got free from drugs and alcohol and just a perverse lifestyle was I got my will back. Because for so long, I was just a puppet from the enemy. Come on, amen. I was just being pulled everywhere. I didn't have, a, I didn't have any uh, free will. What was free will? What was that? I was completely under the influence of Satan in the demonic realm and his demons. And so, you know, any time that I came against any temptation, my will died to the will of the enemy. But the amazing thing was when I got born again, I got my will back. 
And that's a liberating feeling. Because now when the things that I struggled with would come against me, then I would look at it and go, huh, now I have the power to choose right from wrong. See, I think sometimes we miss that when we look at lost people. We can be so critical and look at them and go, why are they doing these things? Why are they still in this rut? Why are they still doing, you know, these drugs and doing these things and living this way? Well, they don't have any power to choose. There's no power without the Spirit of God. That means our freedom in Christ doesn't just function automatically. In fact, over in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19, the scripture there says, I've set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. Here's the amazing thing, what he says. Choose, somebody help me out. I got some theologians in here, huh? Life, wow. He tells us to choose life, saying that choices has everything to do with us remaining free. Everything. I think I've told the story many times, but it's worth repeating. When I was, um, you guys, I won't bore you with my testimony, but everybody knows where, it, where I was. I was facing 30 years. I was, I was in a cell, and uh, that's where I met the Lord Jesus and I had this radical, 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 radical salvation experience. I mean, the presence of the God filled this cell up. I felt the love of God for the first time. It was like hot honey just coming over me in waves. For the first time in my life, I felt the love of God. I felt free. I knew that I knew that I knew when I left that place, I was changed. But I got back into population, and it didn't take long. I was meditating on the things that happened to me in this cell, in this time of uh, just, you know, just, you know, being completely secluded from everything that I knew existed. And this old man that was coming into this jail had been ministering in there, I don't know, 60, 70 years. He was in his 90s. And he was walking down this long corridor with this walker, and his son was kind of inching him along. And I mean inching him along. I mean, he was clearly you know, almost 100 years old. And he got to the door, and they rolled the door back. And I remember me and a young man, I think it was maybe two of us, went there, and I was just, you know, excited. I just had this, this supernatural experience with the presence of God. Is anybody hearing me? I mean, I just had this massive, just, you know, eye-awakening experience. I met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this filthy, nasty, crepid dungeon cell that I was in. So I run to this door with expectations, waiting to hear the wisdom from this old man. And the old man asks this question. And he says, young man, I just want to ask you a question. What is the most powerful thing that you have? And so me, you know, just being, you know, ignorant to the word and anything, I just said, Jesus. <laughs> and he said, and the young man behind me goes, the Holy Spirit. And he said, no. He said, the power to choose life or death and I tell you those words burned into my spirit they burned into my heart and to this day that is the same thing that I go back to when I go to making any decisions that I have the power to choose life or death. Let me tell you something this morning, church. Every decision you make brings life or death. Every decision you make brings blessing or cursing. I'll say it over on this side. Every decision you make brings life or death. Every decision you make brings blessing into your life or brings cursing. Opens up the door to the demonic realm, what you watch, what you listen to, what you hang around, what you become. Ultimately, you open up and give the devil an inroad into your life and say, come on in, have my marriage, have my family, have my finances. Anybody hearing me this morning? Have everything I got. Or you make a decision that for me and my house will serve the Lord and you guard every thought, every attitude of your heart. until we conform to the image of Jesus. He says you must choose. The next thing we look at, we must choose grace. We must choose grace. Let's go back to Galatians. If you weren't already there, I turned. He says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man who is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. 
Christ has become no effect to you. Whatsoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Paul is saying if you're trusting in anything other than Jesus, you're wasting your time. Can I just break it down in layman terms? If you're trusting in your own goodness, if you're trusting in your performance, if you're trusting in how well you do at church, how much you read your Bible, how much you pray, how much you do for the elderly people around your community, if you're trusting in any of these things other than the blood of Jesus, you have fallen from grace, my friend. I know there's a prevalent doctrine in the body of Christ that you fall from grace when you get into sin. That is not what he's talking about. The context of what he's talking about, if you're putting your faith and trust in anything other than Jesus, my friend, you are falling from grace. You're falling from grace. How many know grace doesn't fall from you? <laughs> Titus says it this way. He says that the grace of God has appeared unto all men concerning salvation. The grace of God is always being extended to every person. The problem is we don't embrace it. I like to heard a sermon one time with uh, one of my favorite pastors, Judas Smith, was talking, and he was talking about this analogy of grace and embracing it. And he gave this story about an old man that was kind of never really had any affection, never was, you know, uh, hugged or anything like that. And his wife, Chelsea, you know, is a hugger, and she's real affectionate. And he said, you know, the old man was coming to the church, and, and, they, and they went in, and, and Chelsea's like, hey, how's it going? And went to give him the hug, and, the, and he was kind of like, mm, 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 yeah, mm, you know. He was just this awkward thing, you know. He'd never given a hug before, and I think a lot of times that's how we are with grace. Grace is coming at us in the person of Jesus and all his goodness and all his glory and all his mercy and all his gifts and all his blessings, and we're like that old man. We're kind of, hmm, 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 hmm. You ever get a hug like that from somebody? What is this? You get the little, the side hug with the little tap on the side. We're laughing, but that's how we do grace. The apostle Paul is saying this morning that we must choose grace. He says the phrase that Christ shall profit you nothing is another way of saying that people who turn to self-effort or performance for salvation cannot benefit from anything that Christ has provided. And that's a good place for an amen. The only way to appropriate what Jesus did for us is by faith in his grace. Choose right relationships. In verse 7, Paul says that you ran well. Who did hinder you from obeying the truth? Wrong relationships, church, will keep you in bondage. Can I just say that this morning? Evaluate your relationships. When I was a youth pastor, I used to say this. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Uh-oh. Ultimately, what you hang around is what you become. I know we all have this great missionary mindset, we're going to save the world, right? You see this in relationships? Oh, I know he drinks and smokes and parties and all that, but I'm going to change him. Come on, ladies. Huh? Can I get some help in here this morning? Huh? My wife tried that for years. Ask her about it, how it worked. Huh? Everybody told her, leave that joker. <laughs> get far away. Get in your car. Go back to Lake City. I can save him. I can change him. It's the only spirit of God that can change a person. It's noble and great. I like the idea, the idea of us changing people. But really what happens, we become like them. I was counseling this week with somebody that's been working in an environment where, you know, they're just, it's worldly, it's carnal. Every other word's a word of profanity and it's very worldly. And, and he said, you know, I can tell it's having an effect on me. Now, obviously, Jesus said we're in the world, but we're not of it. And you know what? Uh, we can't just remove ourselves. <clears throat> sometimes we like to on our jobs, huh? How many of y'all just like to sometimes just remove you? See, I live in a Christian bubble, so I, I really can't relate to you guys. All my friends are pastors and leaders and people in the church. And, you know, sometimes I have to realize that when I'm talking to people. But there was a time that it wasn't like that. And I did walk in that. And I do understand how you come to work and you're around negativity and you're around worldly mindsets. And people just say, go get an abortion if you don't want the baby. Go do this. It's okay if you want to shack up with two dudes. It's okay, you know, if, if a girl's bi to try, I don't know, quad, whatever the sexual preference is today. It's okay. Everybody's doing it. Glory to God. 
And there's this struggle. There's this, there's this spiritual struggle that goes on. Because as Paul said, that the, the spirit lusteth against the flesh. Now, we, 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 we always like to see that word lusteth and we think something sexual. But really what the word lusteth means is strong passion. That's what it means. So it's contrary. There's a strong passion against the things of the flesh. So the spirit is always having a strong passion for you to do things that are opposite to the flesh. Isn't that good? The Spirit of God is warring against the things of the flesh. But how many know the things of the flesh are warring against the things of the Spirit? There's the battlefield. There's the tap that brings us to a place where we're going to let the life of the Spirit of God that lives on the inside of us filter through and manifest in our soulish realm, in our mind, our will, our emotions, or are we going to let the old residue of the old man begin to walk his way out and have his way in our life? It's simply choices. It's simply choices. Whether we'll yield to the Holy Ghost or we'll continue to yield to the things of the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, Paul says this, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. That's a verse for the church today. Evil company corrupts good morals. In verse 9, he says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. What he is essentially saying is even the smallest influence of a false gospel will eventually corrupt all and causing the whole system to fall. See, it starts like the little leaven you put in, a, in the yeast and it leavens. How many bakers do I got in here? Huh? Let's cook some bread before. I know I got some people in here that's made bread. And they put, they put a little yeast in there and what does it do? It gets it to rise. Can somebody help me out? I never bake no bread. All right. <laughs> huh? It's the same way. When people begin to put their false ideas and their worldly concepts and they begin to plague you and bombard you with things, it's just a little bit of heresy with a little bit of truth. My pastor called me last night and um, he said, Sean, I need to talk to you. He was real serious in his voice. And I was like, man, what's wrong? He's like, I gotta ask you a question. He said, I need some help. I said, okay, what is it? He said, I'm in a series and I'm doing this series by one of his favorite teachers and I'm not gonna reveal his name. Everybody knows him here. He's a great man of God. Let me just say that up front. And he said, man, I was reading through this book that I'm doing the series on. And when I got to the blessing, he starts in talking about how we've got to do this and got to do that. And he started reading from this book. Immediately, I was screaming on the inside, but I was trying to be patient and let him finish. He said, I don't, what do, what do you think about? And so I began to share with him the gospel. I said, thank God we're in the book of Galatians right now. Everything we receive is by grace through the promise of faith. It has nothing to do with whether we do or don't do. That's works-based performance religion. And he said, I know. He said, years ago, I would have preached that and never thought anything about it. And you know what the Spirit of the Lord said? It said, um, same thing that, that Jesus said to Peter. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And man, he got excited. He said, praise God. It was the spirit that revealed. I said, you had a witness in your spirit that said, this isn't truth. Everything up till now might have been truth. But when we got to the place where we earn anything from God, whether we do or don't do, whether we, you know, perform or don't perform, friends, it becomes heresy. It is not the gospel that Paul preached. It's old covenant. It's an old covenant mindset. If I do good, I get. Aren't you glad you're in the dispensation of grace? You know what I told him? I said, there's times when I'm missing it and I ain't in the word like I should be and I'm frustrated and things like that. That's when I get blessed the most. Is anybody hearing me this morning? That's when I open the, the mailbox and I've got an unexpected check. <laughs> That's when I go to somebody and they say, Pastor, I just want to bless you. I want to do something. Something radically uh, out of the blue happens when I feel the worst about my spiritual condition. 
Why? Because the blessing's not tied to Sean. It's tied to Jesus, glory to God. And Jesus never falls short. He never misses it. He never messes up. And so I just keep my eyes focused on Jesus knowing that, I, you know what? I'm going to miss it. I'm going to make mistakes. But thank you for the blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that if I keep my eyes fixed on you, glory to God, everything's going to work out all right. Like Oral Roberts used to say, something good is going to happen to me today, glory to God. That ought to be the just the mindset of every believer. Something good is going to happen to me today. You ought to wake up tomorrow morning and look at the mirror while you're brushing the teeth and say, thank God something good's going to happen to me today, glory to God. I'm waiting on unexpected favor today, praise God. Somebody's going to bless me, God. You cause people. You give me favor in every area of my life. You give me favor. Instead of complaining about your job, go in with, with attitude. Thank you, God. You've given me favor with my boss. Glory to God. I walk in favor. You cause people to go out of their way to do something nice for me. Isn't that awesome? He'll cause your enemies to bless you. People that talk about you and backbite and gossip and all that, they'll, he'll cause them to come up and bless you. <laughs> Y'all ever been blessed by your enemy? I don't even know why I'm doing this, but here, <laughs> I know why. Huh? I serve an awesome God. I know why. Because I walk in favor. I walk in the blessing. Choose the Spirit. Verse 16, he says, I say again, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh verse 17 he says for the flesh flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh these are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would this way we do this is living by conducting our actions and everything according to the word of God if we would follow the leading of the word of God as it is quickened to us by the Holy Ghost there's the spirit that's why it's so important that you get baptized in the Spirit. Until I got baptized in the Spirit, the Word of God just was like reading a book. It was. Until I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I didn't really get much revelation. I read it and it was just kind of like, man, I don't get this. The Bible is so hard to understand. But man, when I, when I got filled in the Holy Ghost, you know what? Things just started coming alive to me. I believe that's one of the first initial evidences. Uh-oh, did I say that? That might, come, that might mess with somebody's theology. We always, we always so focus on evidence of tongues. You know what the first evidence was for me? Revelation. The word of God became alive to me. It was rhema. It was the living word in my life. It wasn't now what the pastor was preaching. It wasn't what, you know, this person was saying. It was alive in my life. And guess what? When it became alive in my life, it began to work in my life. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God agree perfectly because the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the Word of God. You know, these people in the charismatic, charismaniac church, that's, can I say that? Well, because I am one, so I can talk about them, right? I'm not being biased. But here's the problem with a lot of charismaniacs, or, or charismatics, rather. They don't check and balance things to the Word. And so they're out there on a whim doing their own thing and it's not lining up with the word of God. Can I tell you this morning, the word of God and the spirit of God agree perfectly? Why? Jesus said my words are spirit in their life. So when you see these things and it, you, you check it and balance it to the word and you go, wait a minute, the words, it's not, the, it might be a spirit, huh? <laughs> it might be a spirit, but it ain't the spirit of God. It might be a human spirit. It might be a demonic spirit. It might be, I don't know what spirit it is, but I can promise you the spirit of God and the word of God will always agree perfectly. Always. Really what this living in the spirit is, is living by the spirit of the word. And notice I said the spirit of the word. See, there's a dead letter of the word. Everybody understand that? Jesus put it this way. He said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, you know, in the Pharisees' eyes, that was the physical act. Everybody got that? I don't have to go into detail on that, right? Y'all didn't catch that. The physical act. Come on, wake up. We're a responsive church. We're not dead church. Come on. The physical act, right? Come on. Y'all look at each other. He's making me uncomfortable. Listen, but what does Jesus say? He says, but I say to you, if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've already committed adultery. See, the spirit of what he was saying is not the intentions of, of your, your action, but the intentions of your heart. 
How many know we commit adultery long before we get in the bed? I hope none of you guys are practicing that in here. But it happens long before you go to the bedroom. It happens with a flirtatious flirt. It happens with an emotional, you know, it's an emotional affair before it ever becomes physical. That's so when, I, when I see pastors that fail and people say, it's like almost like they think, oh, they just, they just flopped in the bed together. <laughs> Wonder how that happened. Well, you know, and these ministries fall and we're like, oh my gosh, so and so fell. Well, if you look back and pattern their life, there was compromise. They were alone. They were alone. Maybe he wasn't getting things at home and, you know, he began to share things with another sex and they had this bond that was inappropriate. There was emotional things going on and instead of dealing with it, they build on it and build on it and build on it and build on it. And before you know it, it was real easy. There was already an emotional affair. There was already an attraction long before there was anything physical. Everybody follow that? That's why it's so important every day that we yield to the Spirit by yielding to the Word. Yielding to the Spirit of the Word. Notice what he says. This verse does not say denying the flesh will produce walking in the Spirit. I think a lot of times we get that mixed up. We think if we just crucify our flesh and we just deny our flesh and beat our flesh, somehow that's going to put us in the Spirit. Can I tell you that is the exact opposite of what Paul is saying? He's saying when we yield to the Holy Ghost, come on somebody, when we begin to let the Spirit manifest, guess what? It denies the flesh everything that it wants to do. You say, well, pastor, I don't understand. What's the difference? It's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. It's like when I, you know, got free from drugs and stuff, you know, when I realized that I identified myself with Christ and my old nature was crucified, follow with me, track with me, and then I was raised in the newness of life. Then when temptation comes, I wasn't trying to overcome and get up all this willpower. I just said, I don't identify with that person no more. That's not who I am. I don't do cocaine. I don't rob people. I don't do those things no more. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. I am a brand new person in Christ Jesus. Now, Get that renewed to what's happening here and that will manifest in your walk with God. And you'll, you know what? It's easy to overcome things like that. I don't muster up willpower to try to overcome temptation. That's not who I am. Why would I do that? Why would I run around on my wife? Why would I steal money? Why would I do that? That's not who I am. Huh, I'm a new creature. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of me. Therefore, I have a will. Anybody hear me? I have the power to choose, and I choose Jesus in every situation. <laughs> I choose Jesus. Isn't that good? I choose Jesus. So when things come, I'm choosing Jesus this morning. I choose Jesus over there. If I want to get offended, I'm going to choose Jesus. I'm not going to get offended. Would Jesus get offended? I'm not getting offended. I choose Jesus. I'm not going to harbor unforgiveness. I'm not going to harbor bitterness towards that person. Why? Because I choose Jesus. Oh, y'all don't like that preaching this morning, huh? That makes y'all have to dig in the closet a little bit. Stir up some things. Huh? That's got, to, wait a minute. That, that means we got to get accountable. Huh? Preach over here. That means we got to get accountable, right? We got to start thinking about things in our lives that we're holding on to that we, we, we say we've released. We say that, you know, I've turned this over to you, God. And then as soon as you see that person, that stomach gets knotted up and, you know, your throat gets dry and you're like, I want to punch him in the face right now. Anybody with me? Am I the only one? That wants to punch people that's hurt me in the past, huh? I said there's still some resi residual effects of the old man. Come on, you got to get some help in here? I told Rodney the other day I was surfing, and <laughs> I'm going to tell on myself, but I'm transparent. How many of y'all know pastor's transparent? So I'm surfing. I've had a bad day. And surfing is one of the things I love to do, and it puts me in a better mood. And so I'm out there talking to Jesus, and, you know, a pretty crappy day, and surfing, and it's kind of... It's not real good. Where's Rodney at? I told him it wasn't real good. It was kind of fun. But the really good part about it was there hardly was anybody out. But there was this kid, and you could tell he was sponsored, and he was a rubber guy, about 130 pounds with bleached white hair. And um, he's on every wave, you know. So 
I'm fixing to take off on it. I finally see a set that I want. I paddle, I'm paddling, I'm fixing it. And I, I get ready to drop in, and I drop in, and here comes this kid, cuts me off. I'm in position. I got the right of way. He cuts me off, and so I pull out. So I was like, all right, I turn around, I paddle back out. No big deal. Another set wave comes about 15 minutes later. I'm paddling for it. I'm thinking, yeah, this is mine. I'm going left. I paddle, paddle, paddle. I drop in. Boom. As I start turning, here's this kid. I go, oh, pull my board out <laughs> and start paddling. Well, y'all wouldn't believe you'd do it again, would you? <laughs> so a few minutes later, we say, okay, one more wave. We had to get back. Skylar had a game. So we had one hour to surf, right? So it counted, right? Every wave counts. So one hour to surf. So we're all deciding we're going back. And so I'm paddling for a wave. And here comes this nice set in the back. I'm like, man, I'm on this. This is my ticket. So I'm paddling, paddling, paddling. I'm deep. I'm deeper than anybody. I got the right of way. I drop in. And when I do, here comes this rubber kid with blonde hair comes around me. And I said, gosh, and pulled my board out. And immediately, I felt my flesh just rise up. And if it would have been to old me, I would have went over here and said, if you drop on me again, I'm going to punch you right in the face. Just that simple. And everything in my body wanted to do it. And you know what? When I did that, I looked over, and here's the missionary and the other pastor that I'm with looking at me going, <laughs> I got caught. <laughs> Pastor got caught in the flesh. He said, settle down. Immediately I was embarrassed. I was convicted. What happened? I let my emotions get out of control. V emotions make a terrible master. They were never meant to lead us. We were meant to lead them. But you know what? Immediately the Spirit of the Lord said, Sean, it doesn't matter if it gets every wave out here. Who cares? You've already got your mind fixed on that instead of fixed on me. I said, you're right, Lord. I said, you're right. So I repented, paddled back out. Needless to say, I didn't get another wave. <laughs> when people walk according to the Spirit of God's Word, they are walking in the Spirit. Those who walk contrary to the word of God are not in the spirit. Walking in true revelation of God's word as quickened to us by the Holy Spirit will operate the promises. We will reap the promises in this life. We need to read the word, speak the word, and act on the word to stay in the spirit. Does everybody understand that? We need to read it, we need to speak it, and we need to act on it. Quickly, I want to give you three things and we're ending and somebody say, I'm ready to eat. Let's see. Three things if you're taking notes. See, I haven't, I haven't done this in a while. Y'all ain't ready for me. Y'all like, Pastor, you don't ever have a three-point outline. I know, I'm mixing things up right now, all right? Huh? Y'all get with me. Follow me, all right? I want to give you three quick things. Number one, renounce. You need to renounce every false belief and philosophy contrary to the Word of God. That starts now. Take a moral inventory of your life. Everything that does not line up with the Word of God, I don't care what you watched on reality TV show, what Granny told you, what Pastor Sean says, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you need to renounce it. You need to turn from it. It's amazing to me how we just follow gifted speakers and, and things because they speak well. We never check out the stuff they're saying. Oh, but they just wow me with their great illustrations and all that. And they're so funny and charismatic and they're preaching heresy. Never checking it out. Never, never comparing it to the word of God. 2 Corinthians 10, chapter 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I was counseling somebody yesterday and they were talking to me about this and they said, well, I, don't, I can't help the way I think. I said, that is a lie from the pits of hell. You absolutely can. Every thought is contrary to what the word of God says about your situation. You grab a hold of that thought and you make it line up right then and if it's not of God, you cast down that imagination. Every vile picture that comes to your imagination, everything that would try to be contrary to the word of God, you say, I cast down that imagination. You know, when I got free, that's what I had to do. I had pictures of me being in crack houses and getting high and robbing and hurting people and these imaginations would come back when I first got born again and I'd have to literally speak to myself, I cast down that imagination imagination in the name of Jesus. That is not who I am. I am blood bought, born again, spirit filled, Holy Ghost, and I will not let that, I will not let that rent space in my mind. And as I begin to do that, I got freer and freer and freer and freer and freer until one day I was free. 
I was free. Now the devil don't even try me with that nonsense. He tries me in other things. He's studying me. He's still working on pastor. Amen. But he can't get me with those. Why? Because I've walked that thing out. Huh? I've held every imagination. I've held every thought and made it come into line up with God's word. You're sorry. You're never no good. You're always going to be this. You're a convicted felon. You're this, you're that. I'm a child of God. Glory to God. I'm an heir to the throne. Hallelujah. Praise God. Greater is he that is in me. Glory to God. I'm living my dream right now, church. Huh? The devil's a lie. Don't you let him lie to you one more day about your past, about what he says you are. You get in God's word. Begin to see what God says about you. He has a whole lot to say about you. And let me tell you something, it's all good. Release. You need to release bitterness, anger, resentment, any attitudes that are not godly. Do not give the enemy a foothold into your life. Remember the words of James, where there is envy and strife, there is every evil work. Let me tell you something. When you get an envy and strife, maybe it's with your spouse, maybe it's with, you know, a family member. What you do then is you create an enemy. Does that make sense? Me and Tara's had to walk this thing out. You know, you don't, you don't get things right with your spouse. Guess what? You open the door and you allow other things. You'll start seeing things coming against your life. And if you go back to this principle... And make sure that you're not in envy, you're not in strife with anything. You shut the door to demonic trafficking. You take the handle and you slam the door and you say, "Not here, devil. No, you ain't getting in here. You're not having my. You're not having. And you're not having my children. You're not having my finances. You're not having anything that God's given me. I shut the door today to demonic trafficking. We have to release." We have to take it, like I said, we have to take a moral evaluation. What's going on? What are things that are hindering us from receiving all that God has from us? Forgiveness will block. It will, it will hinder. It's like a dam in your life. And God has got all this blessing and all these things that he wants to flow to your life. And you've got this big wall of unforgiveness. Let the Holy Ghost tear that thing down and let the floodgates of heaven just wash over afresh and anew. I tell you, it's so liberating when you just turn something loose. And I know there's people sitting in here today that's had been hurt. I don't make light of that. We've all got hurts. Come on. We've all been done wrong. We've all been talked about. We've been physically abused, sexually abused, mentally abused, whatever it is today. When we hold on to it, it holds us still prisoner to that event. And it defines who we are. But it's when we let go of that, when we make a decision to let go and forgive, you know what? The weight comes off. We experience the life of God like never before. We must release. Releasing forgiveness and love will keep you in freedom. It'll keep you in spiritual freedom. It's a good thermometer. Walking in the love of God. Quickly, the last one, renew. Transform lives do not come from getting more emotional or having more willpower. Transform lives comes from renewed minds. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you can see what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You want to know the will of God? Get in the book. Find out what he says about you. Find out what he wants to do in your life. You're not going to get the will of God in your life by watching Oprah. I'm sorry. Huh? By Dr. Phil. Okay? You're not going to find the will of God and the destiny for your life by watching reality TV shows. It's only going to come by a revelation of the Holy Spirit and what God's inspired word says about you. Was that too subtle? <laughs> only by renewing our minds is how we think we can ever be assured of spiritual freemen. Man, if you want to come up. We can either believe Satan's lies or the truth of God's word here's the reality of it the choice is yours going back to that thing the ball whew, is in your court what are you going to do with it what are you going to do with the ball once you get it hopefully you're going to dribble it down the court and you're going to try your very best to do a layup. I'd show you, but you probably, it'd look retarded right now. 
I used to be good. I used to be able to. But you get the ball, man, and you drive that thing home. Why? Because every one of you are a champion, glory to God. He has put greatness on the inside of you. Young people, listen to me this morning. He's put destiny on the inside of you. Don't you let nobody tell you any different. Don't you let nobody lie to you. Don't you let Satan lie to you through people. Begin to get your identity in Jesus. And you'll experience the life of God and the freedom of the Spirit everywhere you go. Amen? Would you stand with me this morning? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, where are you, church? Are you enjoying the freedom that the Apostle Paul is talking about this morning? Are you walking in these spiritual freedoms? Because I want to tell you they've been provided for you. The work's been already done. Don't you like that? I like when I come on a job and the work's already done. <laughs> Did I tell on myself? <laughs> My associate pastor's going, yeah, that's right, pastor. I like to come into a job that's already done and then I can say, man, that looks great. There's nothing left to do. Glory to God, I'm going. But uh, Jesus has already laid the foundation. He's already done the hard part. He's already dug the footers. He's already poured the car. He's already done all that. It's already there. That's good, isn't it? Now we can just become partakers of that. Glory to God. Well, with every head bowed and every